Hello, I'm Eugenie Scott. For over 25 years, I have helped the National Center for Science Education become the go-to place for information on the creation and evolution controversy, and more importantly, the go-to place for all the citizens who have needed help in defending the integrity of science in this local classroom. I'm very excited to introduce you to my successor, Ann Reed, who is going to be taking over as Executive Director of the National Center for Science Education. So, hello Ann, and welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really, really delighted that you're going to be replacing me, because I think you're going to find this a fabulous place to work, you're going to find it a fabulous um, cast of characters on the staff to work with, and our NCSE members are just amazing. Well, I'm looking forward to it, but it's uh, pretty big shoes to fill. <laughs> You really have all the, the pieces that the executive director needs, quite honestly. I mean, you've got a background as a research scientist. You've got um, uh, wonderful networking with uh, the scientific community based on your, your work at the National Academy of Sciences. And you've been a nonprofit manager, so that's everything you need. I want the NCSE members to get to know you like the staff and I've gotten to know you over the last couple of months. Tell us how you got into science, because you didn't start out in science. Well, my undergraduate degree was in environmental studies, so there was a good bit of science um, involved there. Um, but I certainly didn't leave my undergraduate years feeling like, oh, I want to be a research scientist, and quite the opposite. I, I wanted to be involved in politics and in um, saving the world through the law of the sea, or I don't know what. I had all kinds of ideas of places where policy and science might uh, overlap, but I was more interested in the policy side. Um, but after a few years of that, I realized that that was um, really not my gift. Uh, I wasn't patient enough for the wheels of politics to turn. And, and I was very frustrated with a lot of the policy um, environment was really what persuaded people was rhetoric. It wasn't evidence necessarily, and I found that very frustrating. So um, I got a job in a lab as um, sort of a stopgap measure before my planned entry into medical school, and I never left. I just uh, really loved doing science in the lab, and that was a revelation to me. I had not really enjoyed lab work in college. What, what was it about science? What, what was it about working in the lab that really, that really hooked you? You didn't know how things were going to turn out. Um, and unlike in school where you, you do a, a lab and you know that the teacher has an expectation of how the lab is supposed to work and you were great on uh, how well you hit that bar, you know, did you make it come out exactly the did way it was supposed follow, to? Did you follow the recipe? Right. I was bad at that and I didn't like it and I found it boring. Um, but in the lab, you know, the first time I did an experiment, it didn't work. And I, I loved it. Yeah, you'd later find out that, you know, that none of them work. The exceptions are the ones that work. Um, so I was just intrigued. You know, did it not work because I didn't do something right? Or did it not work because the way I thought the world works is not the way the world works? And sorting that out and then finding out that little bit more. Well, I now know this little bit more about how the world works. What's my next question? I, it was irresistible. And that's the heart of science. It really is. I mean, that's, that's why we all... Get into science, that's why we want other people to understand science as well. Mm -hmm. Now, you spent um, a very large part of your professional time at the um, Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And one of the things that you did that, that we found very intriguing to hear about was you were part of the team that sequenced the 1918 flu virus. That must have been a pretty fabulous experience. It was. It was a privilege, really, um, because every time I got a little piece of that sequence, I knew that I was the first person who'd ever seen it. And so that was very exciting. And there was always the possibility that that little piece of the sequence would be the part ex that explained why that virus was so terrible. Um, but, you know, I, I said that I really enjoyed how science doesn't work. And <laughs> that one really pushed that to the limits because um, I spent a year and a half trying to get any indication that there was any influenza virus left in those samples with absolutely no 
positive results. But And that was also very early in the days of, of um, genetic sequencing. I mean, uh, th this was in the early days of PCR. You, you actually had to invent a lot of this stuff and, and learn it on the fly, pretty much, didn't you? Yeah, the, certainly the project wouldn't have been possible without PCR, and PCR was pretty new. So um, figuring out how to design primers, and we made our own design, our, our own primers um, initially, and the primers had to be what's called degenerate. They had to be um, a mixed set of primers because we didn't know what sequence we were looking for. So um, yeah, there were a lot of unknowns. And at the time, another thing that really wasn't known was whether these old um, tissue samples that had been fixed in formalin and embedded in paraffin, whether there would be any RNA left in them at all, um, because it's generally more fragile than DNA. But it turns out it's a great preservative for RNA. And so we were fortunate that it did eventually work. <laughs> the work was really important and, and really um, fascinating, too. After you left the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, you moved to the National Academy of Sciences. You did some work on climate change there, didn't you? Yes, um, two projects. Um, one was a project that the um, National Park Service asked us to do, to pull together a brochure that would explain to people visiting national parks what the potential ecological consequences of climate change might be. And um, that uh, project was an experimental one for the National Academies that we did it entirely um, by phone rather than having the committees actually come to Washington and meet in person. And we had a short timeline. It was a very small budget and um, very, very prominent people in the field who would have been who would certainly have said no to doing the project if they'd had to come to Washington but for it. Well. So that worked out well, but it turns out that I think it would have been done, it would have been much faster to bring them all to DC for one day. To lock them in a room. Yep, and get it written than to yeah. spend six months or eight months Very trying to. Butterflies. <laughs> yeah, I, it was. Um, I don't think we ever had the entire committee on the phone at the same time throughout that process. Well, that's a tremendous amount of coordination. And the reason I, I, I point that out for, for our members who are, are going to be watching this is that that's a big part of what we have to do around here. We do a lot of butterfly herding also. And we also at NCSC work with the science community. The science community and the education community are really our our aces in the hole. I mean, we're a tiny little organization. We've done as much as we have, and we've been as, success, as successful as we have because we have this wonderful network of scientists and teachers that we can call upon and citizens to, to really you know, carry the, the water, so to speak, when it comes to these local problems. Mm -hmm. um, your networking among scientists around the country, I think, is going to be a wonderful, wonderful preparation for what you'll be doing at NCSE. Well, I hope so. And many of my friends in the science community who I've told about this change are thrilled. And they've said, oh, if there's anything I can do, call me. I'll, I'll be calling you. <laughs> when you're working on these reports for the National Academy of Sciences, you had the opportunity to work with quite a range of scientists. Um, how's that going to help us here at NCSE? Well, I think... There's a vital translational role that people, uh, that organizations like the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Microbiology, where I am now, and NCSE play in translating the deep expertise that scientists have into actionable, um, whether it's policy recommendations, whether it's uh, educational programs or textbooks, um, or uh, advocacy, mm -hmm. or just helping the public understand science. Well, that, that's that's, real that's basic. what I mean. That's what I mean by that translational role. That that scientists are often not very well equipped to to make their science accessible and understandable and relevant and and actionable was always the word at the national academies. That if you're going to give recommendations, they have to be something that you could actually accomplish, not. Convince everyone that climate change is, or, or get the U.S. to use half as much fuel as it uses now. I mean, that's a great recommendation, but that, that's not, nobody knows how to get there. And so to help scientists come up with steps that could actually be followed, whether it's to build a policy, to build understanding, to teach students. Um, so I, 
but they're very smart. And so if you set that task before them and help them work their way along the path of making their, their scientific um, discoveries and their insights applicable to whatever field you want to apply them to, um, that's the same job, I think, for, for NCSE or for the National Academies. And so I do feel like having a lot of experience with working with a lot of scientists in that process of getting from what they do in their lab um, to, or what they do with their telescope or what they do um, wherever they do their science out in the field to the place they want to take it. That's, a, that's something that I have a lot of experience at. And that's good because that definitely overlaps with the kind of, of things that NCSE needs to do. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to your Rolodex <laughs> <laughs> of people that you can uh, ask for help. You know, another group that I think is important in that process that we didn't make nearly enough use of at the National Academies are the people who study communication. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even we often didn't have, if we were doing a straight science report, we often didn't have educators in the room. And I think where you really get um, traction is when you get the scientists and the educators and the people who understand communication and in the room together, then you can really... Um, they can each help each other achieve things that none of them could and have done can by make themselves. A whole lot more progress yeah. when you have those three. It's a three-legged stool. It really is when you're dealing with the kind of educational issues that we are. So yeah, I I, I totally concur. I think that's that's very very much very important. So here's NCSE. We've um, we've been churning along here for the first quarter century. Um, do you have any ideas as to where you think NCSE might go in the next couple of decades? Well, I'm tempted to say, wouldn't it be nice if you didn't need an NCSE? Oh, totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah, let's work our way out of a business. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we all want to be out of a job. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess I would, I would love to see some ways, to explore some ways to... Um, to achieve two goals. One being, can we head off some of this reaction against science before it builds up and um, get out ahead of some of these um, denial of science and fear of science and demonization of science? Can we get out ahead of that and prevent that from emerging and taking um, really taking hold? And the other is related, which is that so it, these um, both of these topics are so often presented as black and white. Yeah. You either believe in believe in evolution or not. You either believe in climate change or not. And pe and framing it that way makes people think, well, I've got to be on one side or the other. And all of my friends are on this side of thinking that climate change is a conspiracy. And so I guess I believe that too. And with evolution, you know, all my friends think that it, it means I can't believe in God, and I, I'm not comfortable with that. To try to reframe both of these issues in terms of m most people, I think, with evolution, if you, if you ask them questions about evolution without saying, this is a question about do you believe in evolution or not, <laughs> um, to say, which are more closely related, a dog and a cat or a dog and a fish? But I think that intuitively, people yes. do actually um, accept that, of course, that's how life is related. And um, so rather than framing it as, are you going to have to take evolution, we're going to make your kids learn evolution in school, to just frame it in a completely different way, to just sort of get away from the black and white and the, the two sides. And um, I would love to see NCSE work with other organizations that are making an effort to improve science literacy and science education and and maybe make that contribution of um, some reframing. Mm -hmm. You know, so much of what NCSE has done in the past, the first quarter century, has been reactive. I think that going after some of the root causes of, of these problems, that of anti-evolutionism and anti-climate change uh, sentiments, is something that NCSE can work on. Um, all we need is 
more staff. <laughs> <laughs> All we need is a bigger website. All we need is the resources to make that happen. And I think under your leadership, that's going to happen. Well, I, I look forward to n not solving those problems myself, because I don't think that I can. But to um, draw on the experience of if you bring enough really smart and motivated people into the room and you give them um, a, a problem to solve, they can come up with some amazing things. So if I can facilitate that, then that would be really exciting.